Thank you, Jessica. I'm excited to welcome you all to our webinar on human-centered approaches to data and digital services. This webinar is part of our Civic Analytics Network Initiative, which is a peer network of chief data officers from across the country. Today's presentation is a version of a workshop that we had at our summit on data smart government here in Cambridge last month. So if you'd like to learn more about that event and the Civic Analytics Network and many other resources on data-driven government, please visit datasmartcities.org. With that, I'd like to introduce today's presenter, Robert Barak, who's a Civic Analytics Network Fellow based in the city of Pittsburgh. Thanks, Robert. Code version of the presentation we did at Harvard's Data Smart Summit. For those of you who were able to join us in the room in Boston, uh, there's some new bells and whistles and content added in here, uh, so don't dismay. And for those who are joining us for the first time, it's such a pleasure to be talking uh, with all of you. For those on the East Coast, um, this is hopefully a good time to uh, do some learning on your lunch break. For those on the West Coast, it's a good excuse to delay the workday. And for those listening elsewhere around the world, again, um, just welcome. Such a pleasure to bring this to a wider audience. Like Catherine and Jessica mentioned, this will be available on demand later if you want to go back, if I've talked too fast, if you, um, you know, have something that pulls you away, uh, you'll be able to, to go back to this at a later point. Uh, and also to share it with your team and colleagues, because hopefully this is content that resonates not only with you, but um, throughout the organization or municipality that you represent. Before we get started, I want to give a special thanks to Nick Marlton, who was a work and thought partner uh, on this and on the uh, session I did at the Harvard Data Smart Summit. He's with Brocade Studio, a really great human-centered design consultancy. Thanks, Nick. Um, and again, welcome, everyone. Um, I'm Robert Brock. I have the great honor uh, and privilege of being a fellow at Harvard's Ash Center at the Kennedy School. It's such a pleasure to be at the Ash Center and at Harvard, not only because it's the same school where Elle Woods went to, but uh, it's because the Ash Center itself is the preeminent voice for innovation in American government. Uh, and the Ash Center hosts this great network called the Civic Analytics Network. It is a consortium of the leading chief uh, data officers from cities around the country, around the U.S., who are um, leading in terms of analytics, data visualization, predictive analytics, and how those uh, methods and practices can address pressing social issues. I do this work uh, with the Ash Center and with the Civic Analytics Network and complement it and ground it and contextualize it in local work in Pittsburgh, where I happen to live. Um, and that work involves a series of special projects for the city of Pittsburgh's chief data officer, as well as for the Allegheny County Department of Human Services, one of the leading human service agencies in the country. So it's great to be in Pittsburgh, and it's great to work with these two um, organizations. Previously, I was at the Richard King Mellon Foundation, a large uh, private funder, working on a number of projects that centered around reimagining American manufacturing, uh, especially in light of the maker movement. So that's a little bit about me. Uh, we're going to cover a lot of content today. And while I'll be specifically using examples from the public sector, right, governments, uh, nonprofits even, the concepts and practices that we'll talk about have really broad applicability. Um, and as a thank you for listening in today or, or listening in at a later point, um, I uh, have made myself available uh, for a, a lot of hours, actually, over the next uh, two weeks for short 30-minute phone conversations to dig into a specific challenge or things that you want to talk to as a follow-up to the webinar, um, challenges that are specific to your city or organization, and to think through how human-centered design might be helpful. They're really fun conversations. You don't have to prepare anything. I've had a number of them over the past couple of weeks with um, everyone from leaders of an, a major American public school system to the strategic planning team for the city of Dubai to a city manager in a rural small town of several hundred folks. So whatever your set of questions or situation is, uh, it'll be fun to dig into it together. And these conversations inform the regular writing I do for Harvard's Data Smart City Solutions, which is a fabulous uh, online publication that Harvard uh, and, and Catherine run. Uh, so you can sign up for a talk now or at the end of the webinar by visiting tinyurl.com slash hcdtalk. I'll pull this slide up at the end of the time um, if you miss it now. So as we go along, uh, pose questions if you have them or reactions or feedback using the chat or the Q&A box. The Harvard team is going to collect those questions, collect that feedback, and uh, depending on how much time we have at the end, filter through the, the questions that are bubbling up um, as we go through the content. So 
With no further ado, uh, let's get started. So you're likely here because you've heard about or encountered human-centered design in some way in your work. Uh, and so before we define and go deep on what human-centered design is and how you might use it, I think it's useful to take a step back or a step out and consider design as a whole, how design might be important in our work and in our lives. And I want to take a few minutes just at the start here to make an argument about the ubiquity uh, and I think therefore the importance of design in our world and our lives. You might be already a believer of the, of the things I'm going to say, or you might push back a little or a lot. Either way, um, I want you to um, you know, think through it with me a little bit, and it's a useful starting point for our conversation. So here we go. At almost all moments in your life, uh, I think that design determines in some way the experience or experiences you have in the world. And I want us to think about that and dwell on that. From the moment you came into this world, uh, kicking and screaming, mother exhausted but beaming, design began to alter your experience, sometimes in small ways. You woke up today in Pittsburgh or Boston or Tulsa or Chattanooga or wherever because of a blaring alarm clock or the soft strum of an iPhone harp or because the sun rose and its light pushed through your blinds and fell just over your eyes. You woke up tired because you were restless all night from noise beyond your apartment or from the lack of noise outside your home or from memories of ambient screen light before you went to bed or from a mattress that didn't quite conform. You traveled to work in a car, maybe across bridges or on a train, wrapped in a headphone cocoon or by bus, or maybe you were even on a plane this morning or traveled by foot all through spaces and systems that are designed. You probably crossed the street and you waited for the right signal or the right sound, or you didn't wait. In some ways, everything is designed. There is symmetry after all in the swirl of a flower, pattern in the weave of a spider web, and intention in the way a forest uses fire to clear itself. From the moment you could first walk, design was at work in the background, determining in some way the kind of life you might live or lead. The implications were small and large. You grew up in the city. You lived near a park, maple trees, and a sunken meadow where you were allowed to play after school. You met kids there you wouldn't have met otherwise, and some of these kids became your friends. And in the way that we are the sum of all things, this experience was possibly formative. You grew up in the city, maybe, where there wasn't a park in walking distance. In fact, you don't remember seeing the color green too often. But there were buildings with brick and thick glass and sometimes bars. And every Friday, you went to the mosque. Every Sunday, you went to church. Every weekend, you went to the library. And you looked up and you walked in, and you saw a high ceiling in an open, beautiful room, and your sense of possibility grew. It expanded. Or you never went. You just saw brick and thick glass, and you never thought to look up, and maybe you're sense of possibility um, for the world shrank or remained static. All of this, all of these moments, all of these textures I'm talking about are the work of human decisions in one way or another, decisions that can be intentional or uh, lack intention, and the systems in which those decisions are made. As folks who do work in cities, nonprofits, academic institutions, we are in a unique position to help design a better world with better experiences and better outcomes whether it be through a city service, a product, an application, a program, or an improved organization. And for so long in cities and nonprofits, if we wanted to improve something, we might follow a pattern that looked a little bit like this. We might consult a few subject matter experts, bring a team together, sit in a room, uh, talk together, do some brainstorming, and settle on an idea and get to work on implementation. And in that regard, we designed things for people. We designed services for people, um, not with them. And consequently, uh, consequently, rather, our products and programs and services sometimes or oftentimes affected the world in a negative way or in ways that we didn't anticipate. Today, uh, we're going to lay out a pathway for what I believe and what cities and nonprofits are finding to be a better way forward. We're going to do a, a few of these things. We'll define human-centered design and build a common base of understanding. We'll consider where we are, each of us, um, 
as individual practitioners and as folks who are in organizations and municipalities will consider where um, those organizations and municipalities are in terms of their understanding and use of human-centered design. We're going to review 12 key skills or methods in four categories. We're going to discuss four, and I actually put additional ones in here so there'll be four plus case studies focused on how cities and nonprofits are applying these approaches. Um, those will be pretty interesting. And we'll consider how we, and uh, again, this is both the individual we and the organizational or municipality level we, uh, might use or modify these approaches for our own work because they are um, not prescriptive, they are a starting point. So what do we talk about when we talk about human-centered design, borrowing from Raymond Carver there? Uh, let's define it before we move forward. Uh, this starting point for the definition comes from uh, one of my favorite books, which is by Don Norman, a usability engineer and designer who now runs the design lab at the University of California, San Diego. In the late 80s, 1988, he wrote The Design of Everyday Things um, and talked about how so many of the objects that we encountered in our life, and we might use a tea kettle or teapot as an example, are um, designed in such a way that's either problematic or not focused on the user or have other sort of unintended usability consequences. So we think about the tea kettle or teapot because have you ever used one that um, you didn't have to wrap a towel around your hand or you know, it didn't have some inadvertent spillage. It was just sort of an, an object, and he put it on the cover because it indicated um, how product design had failed to build for its users. And he um, specifically in product design talked about user-centered product design um, and extrapolated that out and talked about human-centered design uh, and then started to apply that uh, not only in the product design world, but in other realms. And talking about human-centered design specifically as being uh, sort of a design philosophy that meant starting with a good understanding of people and the needs that design is intended to meet. And that this understanding comes or could come primarily through observation. And, and if we're uncomfortable with the word observation, I'll give some alternatives a little later on. And that um, this ultimately is done through rapid tests of ideas, and after each test, you would modify the approach and the problem definition. That rapid test of ideas is um, something that has become uh, much more familiar to us, especially in municipal work, right? We talk about prototyping or um, iteration or even the sort of agile scrum way of working has become more popular. And if we're to put this a little bit more in plain speak uh, and, and modern speak, uh, I would define human-centered design, and I think broadly it's defined now as a framework for developing solutions, solving problems, developing products, designing programs, tackling digital services in a way that involves the perspective of users, clients, residents, whomever uh, might be interfacing with that solution problem um, product or program, in all steps of the process and in a really sort of threaded intentional way. So that's what we're talking about today. It's a framework for doing all of the things you might want to do in a way that involves the perspective of users, clients, and residents throughout uh, the design process. And we'll talk about what involvement means and uh, what some steps might be. So uh, we've really seen what the world looks like without human-centered design. And we know probably from our own work some of the problems that has engendered. For most of us operating within bureaucracies, um, this kind of paper trail we see on the screen is really familiar, right? It represents, uh, in this case, a specific stream of paperwork that a client has to fill out to receive a particular social service um, in Allegheny County. Lots of text, not super user-friendly. Um, and this is because the, this is designed by the bureaucracy, which wasn't designed necessarily uh, for, um, with the user in mind, it wasn't designed necessarily for efficiency. The bureaucracy uh, initially was designed, right, in the early 20th century, really to reform uh, what had been corrupt urban political machines. And it was designed around fairness as an operating principle which we know is important. It's the reason the post office, for example, mandates that at least one brick and mortar post office be in every zip code. And in rural areas, you might say, well, that's not the most efficient way to do postal service as a distribution system, but it is a fair one and we care about fairness. Um, and now 
technology has enabled us to do a couple of things at once that we weren't able to do, especially in the realm of municipalities, achieve efficiency, be transparent if we want to be transparent, and act in accordance with fairness. It's allowed us to do all of these things that um, didn't always uh, easily sync together uh, in the past, and we'll talk about that. So this specific example of a world with that human-centered design comes from my own uh, beloved city, Pittsburgh. A few years ago, the city of Pittsburgh determined that it wanted to upgrade its parking meters to offer more options for residents, including the ability to pay for parking on a mobile app. And that sounds great, right? It's a beautiful thing. We love that. Something to really cheer on. Uh, and the city spent a good deal of money contracting with a third-party vendor to, to do that and had a big rollout, only to discover that residents in wheelchairs couldn't reach the buttons they needed to touch in order to operate the meter. And we know that that presents a whole host of problems, right? The meters themselves were costly to replace. Luckily, in that case, that was on the vendor and, and not the city, given the nature of the contract. But really, there's a, a loss of public trust and a perpetuating of a perpetuation, perpetuation rather, of a feeling uh, among these users, these residents, that the world might be a place that wasn't designed for them or might be uh, built in a way that is inherently hostile to them or who they are. And we know sometimes that loss of public trust is just as valuable, if not more valuable, than the actual monetary cost. So why might human-centered design, again, this framework for developing solutions, products, programs that involve the perspectives of clients, users, and residents, why would they, why might that be a better alternative? Uh, why wouldn't that be optimal? And here are some reasons that I think it's a great, useful approach, regardless of who you are. One, it's genuinely different. Uh, it is a genuine seat change, paradigm shift. We'll talk about that a little bit more versus how a lot of organizations and municipalities are operating. Two, it's scalable, um, regardless of the size of your city or, or organization and regardless of the level of which you want to implement it. Um, these methods and approaches really can right fit to wherever you're at. Um, you have to do a little bit of that translation, but um, they can move as you move. Three, they're compatible with what you're already doing. There's a lot of ways in which they can thread into the, the processes that already exist with, you know, not major overhauls all the time. Four, they're approachable. You can really take a couple of the things you hear today and implement them tomorrow if you want to or in a relatively short sprint. Um, it's something that, of course, gets better with time and practice, but they are, um, you know, a lot of ways designed to be intuitive to the users themselves, the practitioners themselves. And lastly, I think they're useful. They're genuinely, um, they genuinely make a, a difference if done right and consistently. And we'll talk about the ways in which they've made differences in cities and municipalities that we highlight in the case studies. So these are the reasons to consider it. And it's part of a larger paradigm shift and uh, towards digital services and use of data. This is, um, you know, really what we're talking about in the, in the title of the webinar, uh, human-centered design is, is part of a whole uh, sort of movement or seat change that's larger and that it enables and is connected to. There's a great uh, new book out by Stephen Goldsmith, who uh, is at the Ash Center, Neil Plyman at NYU, called The New City OS, which talks about um, the power of user center or user-centric government. And they argue that cities, uh, and you could apply the word nonprofit here if you wanted to, uh, they must widely adopt a user-centric orientation that mirrors the private sector's success in meeting customer needs through the framework of UX or user experience. And I would say that achieving user-centered government um, requires more fundamental changes to the ways in which our cities operate and the methods by which they understand and meet residents' needs. So, you know, human-centered designs are, are methods that allow for user-centered government or user-centered nonprofits, but they're not the only thing that needs to change. And um, this is sort of just a thought piece that comes from a, a great person at the city of Pittsburgh, Nick Hall, who is um, our uh, open uh, data and digital services engineer and, and a real smart guy, who talks about how, again, the move, uh, the, or technology rather, has enabled uh, specialization, right? Uh, enabled us to um, provide users and residents and clients with dynamic experiences that can be designed around um, their expectations or their sort of individual needs or wants. 
Um, and whereas the industrial revolution um, or industrial efficiencies rather were all about standardization, right? Uh, digital efficiencies is around specialization and we're able to do that now uh, because of technology. So that takes us to the digital services piece. Uh, we see evidence of this being put into use, human center design being put into use with some impressive results already in the public sector. 18F is a digital services agency that uh, is embedded within the federal government and operates like a startup. Uh, and human center design is one of its core principles um, as a federal digital agency. Um, getting a little closer to the ground, Boston's Office of New Urban Mechanics operates uh, as a sort of quasi design strategy consulting agency. They might not, they might not use those words and, and you know, maybe it'd be a little bit hyperbolic, but um, to me, they, they've, I've seen great evidence of them using human centered design um, as an internal consulting group within the city of Boston. And that work has caught on in Boston where the redevelopment authority is experimenting with co-design processes that give its digital platforms uh, and its programs and its outcomes a, a sort of a user-centered lens. Uh, and the way they've driven that forward, at least initially, appears to be in giving their digital platforms a facelift. And while they've brought in an outside partner to assist them, this work really can be and ideally is a bit homegrown. Uh, Detroit, Philadelphia, and other cities are also doing this interesting thing where they're putting storytellers in place. And uh, cities like San Francisco and Pittsburgh, which we'll talk about later, are bringing human center design training to frontline employees through training academies and through other sort of micro interventions. But despite this whole federal and, and local momentum, a few roadblocks exist or, or things to be cautious or noting. Uh, they might be ones that you've encountered as you've worked to bring human centered design into your organization, or they might be ones that you'll encounter a bit further down the road. Um, you know, it takes time and investment to build skills and shift culture. Human centered design rhetoric isn't enough. We see a lot of organizations and municipalities sort of using the language, but the, the walk is a little less certain. And we know that culture shift and uh, skill building takes time, but it, it needs to sort of um, be uh, voiced uh, and be sort of set as, as a real priority. Second, it is in some ways a challenge to existing power dynamics, either in an organization or in a city, um, as well as a challenge possibly to internal structures. There are elements to it that um, either require or are lifted by cross collaboration between departments, for example, and that um, requires not only a culture shift, but a, a structural shift and sometimes. And, you know, again, the bureaucracy designs for itself. It, um, you know, that's a sort of a wrestling that needs to happen. And lastly, we've seen that the sole seeding of human-centered design practice within um, a lot of cities in particular exist within internal consulting or digital services teams, which is great that we have a group of thoughtful, committed practitioners, but, you know, just seeding it there limits its exposure, and it risks human-centered design becoming sort of an elitist specialization, right, which is really what it's not intended to be. It's really something that can be broadly used even by frontline employees in, in lots of ways. So, you know, as you sort of build an internal team that's practicing this and forwarding it, you know, really be thoughtful about how you might democratize the use of human-centered design. You might not even use that jargon or language, right, because it's a, you know, to your police officers or firefighters, you know, what, what, what human-centered design, what are you talking about? But, you know, it's, it's sort of a, a better way or a different way to try out something they might be doing before in a way that, um, you know, allows them to take informed action based on what the folks they're trying to serve have to say or, or, or how they might be affected by a decision. So there are ways you can talk about it without, you know, tying yourself to that jargon. Okay, here we are. So now that we've set up how design is a part of our lives in a deep way, and we've defined human-centered design and talked about how cities and nonprofits are using these methods, uh, we want to, um, you know, take a, a minute to consider where we're at and where our city or organization is at with its use of human-centered design, this is gonna help me get a sense of how to best gear the rest of the conversation. And it will give you, I hope, a more specific lens for the rest of the content. Uh, I'm gonna read each of these places on this human-centered design, uh, of the spectrum of human-centered design usage. 
And as we go through each of these, I hope that you'll listen carefully and consider where you're at. At the end of reading through all of these, we're going to have an interactive poll, very exciting, uh, that'll pop up, uh, letting us know where you or your organization falls on the spectrum so we can see a sense uh, of where the, the room and the group of folks are. So here we go, ready to place yourself uh, mentally and then commit to it uh, with a click of your mouse. So on the spectrum of usage, we've got the traditional paradigm on the left, where the perspective of users isn't included in your processes or how you make decisions. Uh, you might have work to do on this, but you, you might see it as very important for your city or nonprofit. You might be beginning, beginning to experiment using some techniques or methods and trying to figure out what's the best way for us to do this and to include the perspective of users in our processes. It might be fairly embedded in your processes, uh, or um, it might be embedded uh, plus there are, there's documentation, there's communities of practice, right? It's pretty deeply embedded and you're taking steps to document um, new, these new ways of working and build you know, many communities of practice around them. Or you might be here on the far right and say, well, human-centered design techniques are pretty embedded and, and documented and widely practiced in our organization, and we train on this, uh, these methods and techniques. Or you might be somewhere off the spectrum or in between two, um, but we're going to ask you to commit to something just for the purpose of the poll. Um, so, Jessica, if you could bring that up. Uh, it'll give you the, the question and all of the options, and you'll get to click. So take a, a few seconds to reflect while we're pulling up the poll. Hi, there Robert. it is on the right. Yeah. So I'm going to answer as well. We're going to give folks a few more seconds, and then hopefully the results will just pop up. Just let me know when to close the poll, and then the results will show. Let's do it. Let's, um, let's, let's count down. Five, four, three, two, one. This is the future, folks. Very exciting. It's giving it 15 more seconds. Oh, wow. Okay, beautiful. Okay, 10 more seconds. So while, while, mm -hmm. while we wait, I, I want to mention that, you know, your movement on the spectrum might go forward as you, um, you know, bring this to your organization or, or city, or, or sometimes it might backslide because of some of those roadblocks or challenges we talked about. So not a static thing. So here we are. Beautiful. Oh, this is perfect. So we can see where uh, folks are at. Most of us, almost half the room, they're at beginning to experiment. So they're trying to figure out how does this best work in their uh, context. We've got a few uh, folks on the far right, a few folks uh, in documented as well, but it seems like the majority of folks are just beginning to experiment. So that is going to be super useful. I will try to speak most um, to the left side of the spectrum, uh, but folks who are in documented and communities of practice and human-centered on the, on the far right, I'll also have moments where I specifically say, hey, that's something that you should really consider or, um, you know, I'll try and frame something uh, in a way that's useful for you. So don't feel dismayed. Okay, that's super useful uh, to me at least and hopefully interesting to you. So let's keep going. We want to talk about those um, skills and uh, the methods uh, that correspond to each of them. Uh, so here we are. We'll just display the categories really quickly. Uh, one is, um, and these are all things that are going to be useful to you as you move forward or, or move along the spectrum. Um, one is understanding context. Designers specifically call this empathy building, but I love how Ai Jin Pu, the brilliant uh, MacArthur genius and organizer of domestic workers, reminds us that empathy is not enough, right? That we must practice strategic empathy. So understanding context is not just about gaining empathy in the way designers say it is, but it's um, really a pathway or beginning to practicing strategic empathy. Uh, additionally, uh, other categories here are defining the problem or defining the problem, prototyping solutions, launching and iterating. You know, there are, this is a framework, and it's a framework like any other framework in that it is 
Um, you know, it doesn't uh, capture every situation, but I think it's one that's useful. Um, you'll find variations of this kind of these categories um, out there uh, in lots of human-centered design resources. Um, so you're getting sort of a, a distillation. Um, you'll see that those four categories map a little bit neatly onto a double diamond, um, which we'll talk about where that comes from in a second, but it's really aimed at finding the right problem by understanding context and defining the problem, and uh, finding the right, or, or finding the closest to the right solution by ideating, prototyping, launching, iterating, um, and it reflects this double diamond that comes from the British Design Council that says the design process has these moments of going out and going in, right? These moments of um, uh, going out or um, moments really of divergence. Uh, you might think about um, the ideation process as something that has some divergence to it, right? We're getting a lot of ideas and then we're converging, we're, we're bringing in, that's where those diamonds close, where, where we're synthesizing or we're selecting one of a few ideas to move forward with. So the design process is both divergent and convergent um, and is a good moment to say that it's not linear necessarily. Uh, it sort of follows these contours, but um, I don't want to be overly prescriptive. Anyway, we're going to cover um, all of these skills and methods in each of the sections, so I'll just breeze through these. But again, understanding context has some things, dividing the problem has some things, prototyping solutions, launching and iterating, and we're going to talk about all of these, if you can believe it. Okay, here we go. Understanding context. So in many ways, um, understanding context, or again, strategic empathy, is a participatory and ethnographic research process. And we understand and respect that there is a, a difference between what can be understood through a research process, process rather, and what Hayek calls tacit knowledge, right? That which can only be learned or understood through lived experience. And while an analyst or a team can do work to better understand the needs and realities of a, a firefighter, for example, to build a, a product or design a better digital service around those needs and realities, they'll never truly understand what it means to, for example, you know, run into a burning building. And that's okay, right? We can have empathy, we can be strategic about it, but, you know, there's some things that we can only um, learn or, or understand through lived experience. That's okay. We just name those, we recognize them, and we respect the difference in this ethnographic and participatory research process. This category can also be thought about as sort of data gathering. And when I say data, I mean, information on your users, clients, residents, et cetera, that can take a lot of forms, as we'll see. And that's what we're talking about. And let's really run through uh, these methods. One, you know, this is one that's going to be most familiar to all folks on the call, um, which is why we'll start with it. One to consider is the, the power and potential of stakeholder mapping. And you probably, or you might be doing that already. To me, this is a, a thing that's like good hygiene, right? You've got to do it. It might not always reveal new insights. You might say, well, I kind of know who all the folks who are affected here. Um, but if you don't do it, there can sometimes be problems that arise, right? Not having um, talked to the right folks or brought the right folks to the table. Uh, and it, it's useful to do also because it becomes a, vis a visual living artifact that you continually can come back to and modify. And we'll talk about moments in which you might bring a stakeholder map back, but it answers these questions at the bottom and it allows us to see the system as a whole. Often, stakeholder maps are a starting point for personas. And um, if you were doing a stakeholder map around open data, for example, you wouldn't just say, well, it's a public. <laughs> you know, you'd break that down into more specific subcategories of users. Personas are a fun and useful way to do that. Here, um, New York City's Mayor's Office of Data Analytics has done some persona profiles around its open data. Um, talking about current and potential users, which I thought was interesting. And each of these personas, um, you know, includes some additional information, right, about um, what this archetypal user might want, be concerned about, which data sets that might be most interesting or relevant to them. There's, there's more to this, but this is sort of a high-level snapshot of how you can use a stakeholder map and dig into personas a little bit. Secondly, we want to talk about interviews and focus groups, right? You've, you've mapped out on your stakeholder map, who you want to talk to, who's important to sort of unearth the perspective of. 
Um, and most often in nonprofits and cities, you know, interviewing or focus groups, you know, they're happening because they're, they're low cost and sometimes they're happening a, a lot because we feel like they're, oh, they're pretty, you know, easy to do. And I, I agree with that, but I also want to check that for a second and say that interviewing is a skill that needs to be developed and practiced. Here are some of my favorite tips and, and tricks and ways of thinking about interviewing. Um, you know, if you've got analysts or you've got a team who um, you're going to send out to do some interviewing, e even if it's only internally with city employees, you know, run them through some practices on interviewing and, you know, click down and review these skills and these uh, sort of things to be conscious of because it's, it's something where, you know, a little bit of elbow grease here can yield some really important um, uh, differences. Lastly, we talk about contextual inquiry. Um, this is important. Um, this is something you might say is observation or um, I'm trying to reframe that as uh, <laughs> paying strategic attention. Um, it just seems like you put the word strategic in front of anything and it works. Um, this is really where you might uh, observe a client, uh, user, resident, city employee in their own context. It might be uh, the work they do. It might be how they're interacting with the current service. Uh, and it might involve pure observation or um, a blend of pure observation and questions and answers. That's specifically uh, the Q&A sort of style is what happens um, a lot with internal employees, right? Um, and this is really important to do because as Margaret Mead uh, reminds us what people say, what they do, and what they say they do are entirely different things. So even if you're just interviewing, um, you know, a set of city employees about a, of a process, you know, what they say might be very different from how they actually operationalize that practice. They might not even be aware. So there's a lot of ways in which this can yield some important things and be thoughtful about how you're going to collect the data on the back end of this. Um, in the city of Pittsburgh, this looked like um, uh, doing something pretty interesting. When the current CDO of the city of Pittsburgh came in to get her arms around the existing context of challenges and opportunities, she and her team spent time meeting with city employees, including uh, possibly this beautifully drawn hipster, uh, to say, show me what you use the computer for. That was the, that was the opening uh, prompt, right? That's open exploratory language. And they actually learned a ton through that sort of Q&A and mix of observation. Also in Pittsburgh, an analyst recently was tasked with digitizing the process the Department of Public Works goes through to receive and uh, complete a possible request. And uh, it was an existing paper form that needed to be digitized. And instead of just doing that, um, you know, off the bat, the analyst spent time observing how pothole crews fill uh, potholes and actually going out in the morning with them and, and learned quite a bit um, because there's information that a form doesn't capture that uh, might be passed on verbally or um, might be done differently. Uh, and with this new insight, the analyst was able to uh, design a much um, better version of the digitized process than they would have without that observation. But notice that the R.K. Mellon Foundation they wanted to change the way um, capital was distributed and non-financial resources were um, provided to businesses in low-income communities. And that meant going out and interviewing lots of business owners to understand needs and build personas. And Brian Stevenson reminds us that this is essential to do this contextual inquiry because it allows us to get proximate, and that's really essential to doing work in the public realm. Let's pause for 30 seconds, just a quick 30 seconds, and write something down here in contextual inquiry uh, in understanding context. What's something that, you know, the last couple of slides have, have, have prodded you to do a little differently or consider a little more or an additional idea that's popped up from you? I'm going to leave a few more seconds of uh, silence as you write something down. And remember, you can always put uh, reactions and questions in the um, Q&A or chat box, and we'll uh, make sure to address those at the end. Okay, moving on here. Secondly, or our second category is defining the problem and defining the problems. And we want to uh, spend time um, finding insights. That's what um, a lot of designers call sort of valuable, interesting data insights. So now that we've done the work to understand the context and we've gathered a lot of qualitative and quantitative data, we need to synthesize it, find important insights, and go, uh, go a level up while 
Um, going a level up means that we're taking a step away from specific information from a specific user or resident or client and generalizing a bit. Hopefully those, those general, generalizations are, are mild generalizations that are close enough to that, um, that data, close enough to the ground and, and pretty well informed. A good way to uniformly code all the things you're learning in uh, and understanding the context phase is uh, through Rose, Thorn, Bud, very intuitive. Rose positive, thorn negative, but sort of opportunities or new ideas. Uh, and from there, we cluster by theme often, right? We say, okay, you know, we've got all this data, we've uniformly coded in some ways. Where are the patterns? What's popping up? A good way to do this uh, is just an identity cluster activity, um, especially if you have a group. So you give people time to write down rows, thorns, buds, or you pull that from all of the interviews and observations you've done. Uh, you've got all of those uh, sticky notes in this example, and you've come up to a wall or a piece of poster paper and place them on one by one, sort of explaining as you go along if there's explanation needed. And it's not in a, in a prescriptive, contrived order, but you allow folks in the, in the group or team to build off each other to say, oh, well, you've put that on, I've got something similar or something that relates. And we put things that are alike near to each other. Uh, and bring clusters together or, or move them apart as needed as we go along. Uh, and eventually, once they're all kind of in place and we feel good about the, the groups, we label them. And we might label them with a keyword or a phrase or designers in particular love these how might we statements um, because it's, uh, it's both open, but it's also a little bit firm. Um, that's especially great if you're doing some eventual ideation. And it's also helpful to pause and make sure you're solving the right problem. And this exercise in particular is useful for potentially reframing a problem. So you've got a problem or opportunity statement um, sort of in the middle here, and you, you're going to move up and down a few levels, moving up asking why and moving down asking how. So here's a quick example. Our problem statement is the police officers don't use the crime dashboard we've built for them. Well, how? How might we go about um, tackling that? Well, we might need to better understand the metrics that are important to them. We might need to convene a group of officers to discuss their priorities and use cases. We might need to do ride-along, right, to see how they use and don't use the tool. Each one sort of connects and allows you to um, create a little bit of an opportunity backlog, things that you've got to do. And if we move up to the why, we're getting bigger here. We're reframing the problem, hopefully, or um, just thinking about how you might communicate about it. So. Why? Uh, well, uh, we, we can better connect officers to crime hotspots. That might, might mean that why we need to do this or um, because it makes our neighborhoods a little bit safer or um, we might do it because uh, we care about how people think and feel about our city. So that initial question just gets a little bit more uh, strung out and you might even change the, the question or problem based on that. Another tool that we've uh, used uh, or seen particularly to be useful in the human services realm is journey mapping or experiencing uh, experience diagramming. If you're interested in those, just Google those terms. It's both a way to structure the research, research process and to find insights. So, oh, is there a, a visual kink I see or a less optimal way a client goes through the journey of getting access to and receiving a service? Um, this is great, uh, especially if it's embedded with consistency. We've seen a lot of efforts and human service agencies, in particular at the county level, that lose steam sometimes because of the, the talented person who loved this left or because it wasn't um, all that important to leadership. So practice it with consistency it can be really important. Um, let's move through here. So let's take another 30 seconds here to, to pause and reflect and write something down in terms of defining or a better understanding the problem. What, uh, from what we've talked about is interesting to you, what might you incorporate in your own work or in your, try to bring to your organization, or, or what ideas or thoughts does this bring up for you? Just take a few seconds to write something down. Yeah, and I love, thank you, Heather. Heather Bardo, she said, you know, it looks like the lean, some lean process improvement stuff. And, I, I think that's exactly right, which is one of the reasons journey mapping and experience diagramming is particularly great for municipalities or organizations that have invested heavily in training around lean, uh, especially doing something like uh, process mapping, because we 
oh, you know, the employees already get, right, that sort of sequence uh, left to left to right, or one thing goes into the next thing. Journey mapping and experience mapping are, uh, there's, there's a little less that you have to do to get those folks on board, especially if they've been doing um, process mapping as part of a lean context. So great comment, Heather, thanks. Let's keep going here. Prototyping solutions. We've converged on a problem. Remember that double diamond? We're at the, the midpoint of the two diamonds. We've come back together, and we need to diverge again uh, as we look for and prototype or test out solutions. This is a great moment for structured brainstorming. Uh, but, you know, often brainstorming is a real pain. We not only do it poorly, but we do it sometimes problematically. You have, I guarantee you, unless you, you are a baby listening to this call for some reason, that you have been in a bad brainstorming session because our ideas are often, um, you know, they, we have to verbally say them and they're immediately filtered. Oh, that won't work. We've done that before. Huh, maybe. Or there's an authority bias, right? There's someone who is a decision maker in the room who we're looking to for feedback immediately on, on those ideas. Or there's been some anchoring that, have, that has occurred, right? A good idea early on stops the exploring and generating process because we're like, oh, that's pretty good. And, and it's often hard, too. It's system two thinking. It's really uh, something our brain's not used to. So there are some better ways uh, that we can brainstorm. Designers in particular think of brainstorming or ideation as insight combination, bringing two unlike things together or two things that have not been brought together before. A creative matrix does this really well, right? On the x-axis, we might have the name of the clusters we came up with earlier, or we might have a list of problems. And on the y-axis, we might have a list of enablers or people or organizations who inspire us. Another way to do this is to take two stack of cards and, and bring them together. So we're, we've got a stack of cards with enablers and, and or people who inspire us, and a stack of cards with problems or, you know, those cluster names, and we draw two randomly, and we say, well, how would Starbucks get more students to engage in after-school programming? Or how would an elementary school teacher design a low barrier homeless shelter? That might sound ridiculous to you, but it often leads to new, uh, interesting, meaningful ideas because, we're, again, we're bringing two unlike things together. Um, and if you do it in a way where people have time to individually think and brainstorm and come together after that's done to explore all of the ideas without filtering, you will have done brainstorming uh, much better than how it's done virtually all the time. Once you have all the ideas in place, it's great to, to filter democratically, to, to prioritize by visually voting with stickers even. Uh, the key is to do it all at once to avoid the pitfalls and biases we talked about, right? Say, okay, here are all the ideas. Let's have folks vote for the one or two or three they like the best. We'll do it all at once. We'll do it silently, and we'll look at what folks have to say. Um, really, it lets the best stuff often rise to the top. At the top. And then the goal is to start, uh, once you've got the idea or ideas that you want to move forward with, uh, to start with as minimally viable a solution as possible, um, even drawing it out first. These uh, images, by the way, come from Luma Institute, which is a great design thinking training organization. They're a little bit expensive, but they're really good. Um, and in Pittsburgh, we used um, the sequence we talked about to do a great um, activity that, that yielded a great idea. I'll talk about that. But again, we're just building up. Uh, as minimally viable as possible at, at first and just testing and trying things out. Uh, and in Pittsburgh and with the, uh, the county, actually the county here, Allegheny County, we used a concept poster activity. We said, okay, well, let's draw out an idea that came out of uh, our visualize the vote process. Let's say, okay, let's dig into that idea a little bit. Who's it for? What problem does it solve? What's the big idea? Why might it fail? How might we measure success? What's you know, have teams draw this out a little bit uh, and then vote on specific parts of that idea that are interesting to us. And from that process came uh, the idea for a shared services portal between the city and county that's not being worked, that's now being worked on. Great idea. Uh, again, these specifically come from Luma Institute. Uh, and at the County Department of Human Services, they're using uh, creative matrices, again, just to create new and interesting intersections. So let's pause here for a second. How might this be useful? How might any of these methods or any of these ways of approaching problems might be useful? What's something that you want to take away? Give you a few more seconds to write something down. 
Okay. Pressing forward. Launching and iterating. Now we, we've got the great idea. We, we uh, got the sort of solution that we think is going to be important and we need to bring it to the world. Um, this is, you know, especially interesting in the world of digital services, right? We need to, we need to do some launching and iteration. Uh, one, we need to get people on board. You could take that concept poster you came up with around, or you might even revisit the stakeholder map and say, okay, now who do we have to go back and talk to? Who do we have to sort of run this working idea by? You've got to develop the product. And the city of Pittsburgh did a great suite of open data mapping tools called Bird's Eye View, uh, honestly probably the best in the country, developed using R Studio, which is an uh, open source, low cost, um, a thing for developers to use um, that really allows the city to build um, up and build on its uh, people and their skills versus um, working with a private vendor to achieve that digital um, solution where, um, you know, building it in-house and with open source tools, uh, it's so much easier to, to make changes that you want to make in an iterative process. And, as you launch, just make sure you've got feedback systems built in, both passive and active feedback, right? We think of passive feedback as sort of collecting data on user behavior. Netflix is a great example of passive feedback, right? If you do anything on Netflix, they have data on you. Um, you know, they'll, they'll say, oh, well, you know, uh, men in their 30s keep, keep you know, pausing um, episodes of 30 Rock at this particular moment. I, I think it gets pretty granular, and there's some interesting things they might probably learn from user behavior and passive feedback. And then active feedback is going out here, like Leslie Nope does, uh, to community meetings, probably with a much friendlier uh, uh, interaction, hopefully, than she often received. Uh, but going out and going to community meetings uh, in Pittsburgh uh, with Berg's Eye View, uh, the team attended 30 plus community meetings, neighborhood meetings, talked to residents who had useful and sophisticated feedback um, on how the tools worked and what additional data they wanted to see. So believe in your users. Let's take 30 seconds here, uh, launch and iterate just to write something quickly down that we might use, or again, that might be interesting to us here. Okay, great. Hopefully you're writing these down and you're keeping them. Um, and you can also share them in the chat or the Q&A. Last two things I want to briefly mention. Uh, again, it's important to democratize usage. Uh, in San Francisco, uh, there's a great uh, data academy that, that's doing some human-centered design and design thinking courses. We're trying it out in the city of Pittsburgh, getting some good results. Um, working with police officers to uh, try this stuff out. And I think there's sometimes a reluctance with some of these methods because they're um, a little playful or visual to say, well, I don't know if it's gonna work for that audience. We've got an audience of executives, et cetera. Um, these methods work and people respond to them. So to have confidence around them. Uh, the Sunlight Foundation did a great tactical data engagement handbook that talks about sort of threading the human-centered design process specifically uh, in an open data context, that's a great resource. And uh, in New York City, the um, Mayor's Office, I believe of Economic Opportunity, um, released a great civic service design handbook that has some good practical uh, methods uh, that are mostly geared for uh, municipalities but I think can widely be translated. So that's a good resource. So here we are. Um, we've got just a few more minutes before we uh, wrap up. Um, to, to take questions or to talk through uh, any feedback you have or to hear your uh, ideas and thoughts. Uh, and I want to say one more thing. Um, as we take questions and, and spend this last few minutes together, remember that you can um, keep the conversation going. We can uh, schedule a time to talk um, at a later date. Uh, it'll be a lot of fun. And you can just go to tinyurl.com slash hcdtalk and sign up now or later, uh, and let's turn and let's see if anyone had anything to ask or say. Um, here we go. This is uh, Angel from uh, Mexico. Hi, Angel. Um, okay, we. That's I don't know if that's one we can get to in this uh, context, but uh, we'll give it just another minute for for questions here. The last thing I want to uh, 
say while those come in is just it's important to, you know, now that you've spent this hour thinking about this, you know, declare a, a legacy or declare, you know, you've written those four things down that you want to do or think about. What's the one or what are the ones that you really want to carry forward from this time? You've eaten your lunch. You are about to start your, your day on the West Coast. Uh, make this time uh, meaningful. You know, you've, you've heard some things. Uh, really figure out what you want to impart. Ah, someone asked Nicole. Thanks, Nicole. This is a great question. How do you do this work in a remote-ish environment? There's a great resource called Mural. Just Google it. Uh, you might have to Google like Mural Remote Collaboration or something, but Mural is a great resource uh, that specifically uh, lets you do uh, design, uh, human-centered design methods with a team um, that is partially or fully remote. Um, and then I've also seen folks get clever and creative about it, right? You've got a, a team and you want to do a concept poster activity. Well, you know, video conference allows you to, you know, hold things that you've drawn up. It's not ideal, but it is, um, you know, uh, the methods are valuable enough that it's worth trying and experimenting with. Daniel, any books or resources you'd recommend? Um, let me, you know, I would say those, those practitioner handbooks or guidebooks are most useful that I mentioned. Um, there isn't a, like, a singular book or tome that's really, uh, that I found to be the sort of, you know, singular resource. Um, something we'll hopefully do as a, result uh, or as a follow-up to this call is, um, uh, once we put the slides up, is maybe linked to a couple of additional resources. But um, there's also a good, there's a couple of good bibliographies I've, I've come across that have links to how folks have tried out these methods. So, you know, stay tuned for that. And then lastly, um, uh, another good question here, how do you open the eyes for colleagues who are not trained in looking at information in this way? Um, this person's finding that buy-in is a challenge. Well, I think it's, it's, a, it's needing to frame um, these methods and these opportunities and this way of going about things in the context of the user or the person that you're trying to get to buy-in, right? Often this is an internal audience. You're saying, you're saying you're making the case for why this should be tried out or invested in, you know, really think about framing it for them in a way that's going to be powerful for, for that audience. It's the reason that we often even avoid human-centered design as, as language to use, as jargon to use, right? We might say, you know, let, this is sort of a new way of working. Let's try it out. And often people have to experience it to really love it and get it. Um, so find moments where you can, you know, try it in small ways and see how people respond and, um, you know, build uh, momentum and, and buy-in there. So, okay. It's 1 p.m. Um, I want to respect everyone's time, uh, and thank you all so much for joining us. Good conversation, hopefully decent content. Uh, this webinar, again, will be recorded and available later uh, for you to, to watch on endless repeat or to share with your colleagues. Uh, and please, tinyurl.com slash hcdtalk. I would love to talk to folks out there who are um, thinking about this, whether you're in the sort of beginning part of the spectrum or a little further on. I would love to to, to, to talk. So with that, I'll um, hand this off. Thank you, everyone, uh, for joining us. Uh, thanks to the Ash Center, um, to Catherine and uh, Jessica in particular for your help here. Such a pleasure talking to you all.